Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today is Tuesday, March 12th, and we are giving away a bunch of new test gear. In addition to our daily prizes, we're also giving away three of these one gigahertz 3000T touchscreen scopes, and you can enter daily until March 15th at wavekeysight.com or using the link in this video's description. Before we get to that giveaway though, we have our test gear tip of the day. There were a couple questions in the live stream chat yesterday about DMM specs, so I thought today we could cover a key DMM spec and what it means. The question was, what's the difference between the number of digits for a DMM and its count? For example, the 34470A that we gave away last week is a seven and a half digit DMM. The one we're giving away today is spec'd as a three and a half digit multimeter. Sometimes though, instead of it being specified as digits, you'll see it specified as counts. So why would you use one or the other and how do you convert between the two? Well, they both spec the resolution of a DMM and the difference is really just verbiage, but it can be very confusing. The confusion often lies in the fact that, and, and this is really important, not all digits on a DMM go from zero to nine. Often the leading digit can't go any higher than one, and sometimes it can go no higher than three or five, and this is due to the internal architecture of a DMM. So if we're talking about a three and a half digit DMM like this one, the one half refers to the first most significant digit, and the three refers to the quantity of trailing digits. So the first digit can typically be zero or one, and the other three digits can be zero through nine. This would mean that there are 2,000 possible states that the DMM can read, or 2,000 counts. It ranges from 0000 to 1999. The count spec is simply the quantity of possible readings on a given DMM. If this were a 3.75 digit DMM or a three and three quarter digit DMM, the first digit could then go from zero to three or zero to five, depending on the manufacturer, who you talk to and what the marketers at that company ate for breakfast that day. It would then be a 3000 count or 5000 count DMM. So this is a three and a half digit multimeter, but it actually goes up to 6600 counts. So the lesson here also is that you should always check the data sheet before just assuming anything based on a digit value. So you can see why this might cause some confusion and hey, why even use fractions at all? Well, that's what's been used historically and depending on who you ask, that's what most engineers understand. It's also worth pointing out that the counts can be different depending on what DMM function is being used. This leads into a discussion about DMM measurement speed, or how many readings per second it can make, and DMM resolution and accuracy, which is basically how specific a measurement can actually be on a DMM, but that's a topic for another video. We also have a bonus tip today from Nick, and he'll build on his last tip and look at another great way to reduce the noise floor of your signal analyzer measurements. Hey everyone, my name is Nick Penn and we're gonna talk more about measuring low level signals. Something that we've talked about in a previous video is improving your displayed average noise level, or DANL, by narrowing your resolution bandwidth. But what if that isn't enough? The next step is to minimize your input attenuation. Lowering your input attenuation does not affect your sweep speed, unlike lowering your resolution bandwidth setting. But you better watch out. A zero dB input attenuation can overdrive your signal analyzer's mixer causing compression and IF overload. For my previous video, here, the top trace shows 100 kilohertz resolution bandwidth, and the second trace shows a 10 dB noise floor improvement with a 10 kilohertz resolution bandwidth. Now, let's see the noise floor improvement when I lower the input attenuation. I'll reduce the input attenuation from 10 dB to zero dB. You can see that we've picked up about 10 dB of additional dynamic range. By reducing the input attenuation and resolution bandwidth, I was able to lower the noise floor by 20 dB. Now we can clearly see the low level spur. If you'd like to learn more about input attenuation settings and improving the sensitivity on your signal analyzer, go check out the application note, Signal Analyzer Fundamentals, which discusses optimizing your noise floor, resolution bandwidth, and more. And a link for that app note is in the description. I highly recommend checking it out. I would really consider it required reading for anyone who uses signal analyzers on a regular basis. And now it's time to draw today's winners. So we're gonna draw a winner for our, uh, our 3000 T-scopes first, why not? Um, so we're gonna give away three of these one gigahertz touchscreen oscilloscopes. Our first winner is Brian Cantley. Congratulations, Brian. Our second winner is Piotr, uh, Peter Bednarsik. 
congratulations Peter. And then Fabian Cernatinger, congratulations to those winners. You won a 3000X. The next prize we'll give away is the 1000X series scope, 200 megahertz, that goes to Paul Collis. The DMMs, the handheld DMMs, just like this one here, go to Kim Sung Yoon and Nikolai Kristoff. Congratulations to Kim and Nikolai. And the probe packs, these are 200 megahertz switchable probes. They're awesome. They go to Jeffrey Kohler and Verdun Vukotic. Congratulations to both of you. And of course, the Bench View winner go, uh, is Cedric Sylvester. Congratulations, we'll be in touch. My DMM turned off. Congratulations to all our winners. We'll be in touch with you in the next 72 hours. Tomorrow, in addition to the daily video, we'll also be live streaming a podcast over on the Keysight Podcast YouTube channel. That'll be at 1.15 Mountain Standard Time. That's approximately three hours after the video for that day airs. And there's a link for that in the description of this video. We'll be discussing new paradigms in the world of RF test gear, because gosh darn it, things are changing. You can also check out the Double East Talk Tech podcast in your favorite podcast delivery system. And finally, there's a brand spanking new schematic challenge over on the Keysight Bench Facebook page for those of you who are on Facebook. And as is tradition, I'll issue the challenge on the YouTube channel, but you have to go check your answers over on the Keysight Bench page. Today's challenge. Given this schematic, what's the lowest voltage you could apply to point A with a power supply to make all the filaments turn on? All the resistors and filaments are ideal and indestructible and assume filaments only turn on when the current through them is two milliamps or greater and that the light emission consumes no energy. Good luck. And that's all for today. Make sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, the Keysight Podcast YouTube channel. And I'm Daniel Bogdanoff. Thanks for watching. You rock. Yes, you. And I'll see you tomorrow. Count counts, 2000 counts. The count spec count or count counts, so the count can be different. My DMM turned off.